like look at the angel that's all oh my goodness so oh. cute oh, he's not feeling well so i got to tell you yeah <laughs> you know i think like my tiktok debut just needs to be doing her tiktoks you should and just narrating it i was watching <laughs> something some random i think it was a cat came up and it's just a strict cat tiktok but this person, whoever owns this cat, shared with how much that their cat made in a year. Oh my god! I of love TikTok, this. and it was like December was like thirty thousand dollars, and I was like, "What? <laughs> cool!" And I was like, "You know what? I did kind of want to do that with the boys, and then they died. <laughs> so fuck, fuck, damn it! Thanks, boys. I know. Because <laughs> people always like they're like you're exploiting your children, but they never feel that way about your animals. No, but they want to see them. You know what would be horrible <laughs> though? Like, okay, say you did make that, and yeah. then they died. I know. Like, then what do you do? Nothing. Like that's. I know. I'm glad I didn't start it. <laughs> I mean, there was Perfect. like a couple of videos in like the beginning of my TikTok, like it's of them, and then they died. So I was like, oh, we're gonna we're done with the animal content for now, <sighs> forever. <laughs> I'm not going to get another animal. You don't think so? No, I don't. Okay. I really don't. I and I can I, see why. I, I mean, never, that's devastating. Never say never. But it has to be like in a uni like the universe divine timing. That's the animal comes to me. I'm not going to go looking for the animal. I'm not going to do. And there's been a couple times where an animal has almost landed in our lap and I was like there's nothing we could do about that. That's God giving it to us. Yeah. But then it didn't work out and I was like good because i mentally cannot handle that right now so yeah i don't know i get we'll that. see we'll see i don't see myself coming up uh, like a up against any strays lately but if that were to happen then we will talk but for now no yeah did i ever tell you about the dog that showed up on our camera up front on new year's a couple years ago i don't know and I stopped what I was doing, literally went outside. I think I was barefoot or something weird. And I'm like looking for this dog. And I tried to get it to come to me. And of course, I would have tried to find the owner. But yeah. um, the dog, I couldn't get it, whatever. I come back inside and I was like, Ruben, I just want to confirm. If we were to have rescued that dog and it didn't have an owner, would we be proud owners of a yellow lab? And he was like, yeah, absolutely. Aww. Like, do I want a yellow lab? No. Yeah. But to me, that's more of like a divine, yeah. like, this is meant for you sort of thing. That's how I feel. So I agree. Okay. How are you feeling today going um, into this? You know, obviously better because now this has been like a long time coming and we've prepared for it. So I feel good. I think I'll still always feel somewhat uneasy now that we like are actually in the thick of it doing it yeah so but who better than to do it with you right now because you've been in my life for so long you've seen all of this change in my life you've been there during that time of my life and now and i feel like i just feel safe well good so i'm glad you feel that way yeah like you're here to kind of hold my hand and like tell me it's okay <laughs> yeah almost, for sure in a way so uh -huh. i feel comfortable well, good. Yeah. And I'm if glad. I feel like I, I still got a little pit in my stomach, I'm not going to lie. I think I'll always have a pit in my stomach when these kind of conversations come up. But I feel better now than I would have, you know, five years ago talking about it. So, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And if at any time you're like, I don't want to do this, like we can just stop. <laughs> for sure. Like, and I, and that's why I feel so safe about it, because I know that if I need even just like five minutes to myself, I'm like, or if we need to reschedule the day, like yeah. literally it won't, you know, know, we just do whatever works. I think I'm good. And you look good today. So thanks. <laughs> thanks. It always helps. Yes. <laughs> um, so today's episode is going to be a lot more, I would say, just deep and serious than any other episode that we've done. And we're going to be talking about abusive relationships, physical, emotional, mental, all of the above um and really just kind of unpacking that yeah and what that looks like exactly because i feel like we all have our own perception of what abuse looks like until you're actually in the situation where you're being abused and you learn so much more about what abuse can look like so 
I thought, why don't we today, after 10 years of being freed from that relationship, um, just kind of discuss what abuse looks like and what it could look like from somebody who was in it. And in and, and hopes of just shedding light on abuse because me prior to this relationship, I really had no idea what abuse looked like except for physical because I feel like for the most part, that's what we all kind of knew what was labeled abuse. So now because I've gone through all of this, I just want to shed light on what it can look like without phys- with physical and without physical and hopefully help somebody if they're in a situation like this or they're having similar warning signs or flat red flags, things like that. And so, yeah. I would also think that a lot of people, kind of like what you were saying about if it's not physical, you know, I feel like that is the most represented just social is socially the word or yeah, just I would say so more broad. Mm-hmm. Um, I would imagine that people that are in abusive relationships don't even know it because it's not physical. Correct. And so I think that's also um, like a really important thing to talk about because I, I mean, I've even talked with people and it's like they, they have no idea that they're in these types of right. relationships and it, that it's toxic and that it's not okay. Yes. Correct. Okay. So let's dive in. Yes. Um, I, I'm just going to say, we could have a safe word and you could say Oklahoma. Oklahoma. <laughs> and you're going through it. No, you know what? I, I don't mind like showing <laughs> vulnerability too. Like that's what this podcast is all about. And like, I'm going to push through it. Like either way, I don't want to put this off. Like we've put it off before. Should we get tissues? Um, well, if the, I'll be all right. If it arises. I have my sweater. I'll go get, okay. I got my sweater. I'll just. You know, I don't not the purpose here is not to like I don't want to give the sob story of like, look what happened to me. I just want to talk about my experience because it's a very real thing and it happens more often than I think we realize. And now in today's society, people are starting to stand up and and call out abuse for what it is. And that's all I want to do today is this is the experience is what I went through. It is abuse. If, if this is happening to you, you are being abused. And don't let anybody else make you think otherwise. I think, too, especially, we've really touched on just even our own differences with our personalities mm-hmm. here on the podcast. And I think it's also important to note, like, you are a very <laughs> confident person. And for some for you to even go through something like this like no one is exempt from right having these sorts of experiences right and just kind of like the toll it can take on someone even someone like you that has that sort of personality you know and also this happened at a very young impressionable stage in my life and so even though i thought i was confident then still being that young still being that impressionable like you said nobody's exempt from it yeah it sneaks up on you so quietly until and you don't realize it until you're in the thick of it and you've basically lost all control so we thought about like instead of just like diving down amanda's story and like going through all of that which we basically will by answering these questions and like going through it this way we thought it would be a good idea to kind of pull up a very reputable website that kind of goes over what abuse looks like and then you can then just like share from there and I think that'll kind of give us a nice guideline yeah absolutely so this is from the national that was super Chicago <laughs> did you hear it national <laughs> it was a national, oh, national. national. <laughs> <laughs> sorry you know and it's funny because like I, it just went right past me I'm like yeah that's how you say it I like hear it all the time I'm ha. <laughs> the national coalition against domestic violence website it says anyone can be an abuser they come from all groups cultures religions economic levels and all backgrounds they can be your neighbor pastor friend child's teacher relative co-worker anyone it's important to note that the majority of abusers are only violent with their current or past intimate partners. One study found 90% of abusers do not have criminal records and abusers are generally law-abiding outside of the home. 
So that's just kind of like a little intro to this article. Um, Well, I don't know if it's necessarily an article, but this website. So these are the traits that abusers have in common. An abuser often denies the existence or minimizes the seriousness of the violence and its effect on the victim and other family members. An abuser objectifies the victim and often sees them as their property or sexual objects. An abuser has low self-esteem and feels powerless and ineffective in the world. He or she may appear successful, but internally they feel inadequate. An abuser externalizes the causes of their behavior. They blame their violence on circumstances such as stress, their partner's behavior, a bad day, on alcohol, drugs, or other factors. An abuser may be pleasant and charming between periods of violence and it's often seen as and is often seen as a nice person to others outside of the relationship. This next section says that these are the warning signs of an abuser. Extreme jealousy, possessiveness, unpredictability, bad temper, cruelty to animals, verbal abuse, extremely controlling behavior, antiquated beliefs about roles of women and men in relationships, forced sex or disregard of their partner's unwillingness to have sex, sabotage of birth control methods or refusal to honor agreed upon methods, blaming the victim for anything bad that happens, sabotage or obstruction of the victim's ability to work or attend school, controls all the finances, abuse of other family members, children, or pets, accusations of the victim flirting with others or having an affair, control of what the victim wears and how they act, demeaning the victim either privately or publicly, embarrassment or humiliation of the victim in front of others, and lastly, harassment of the victim at work. Now, just even you reading back, I'm not kidding you, I'm... I got chills. Just tingly, like my body's going numb. But just like hearing it outside, like from a someone else speaking those words, because obviously I read the article too, but just hearing it sinks in so much more and just makes this whole situation even more realistic um and i i'm so thankful that there's articles out there like this and these hotlines are here to help because it just makes me think what could my life have been if i had maybe resources like this available would it have changed um the outcome of the situation i'm not really sure but just hearing what abuse looks like if you would have shown me this 10 years ago i would have just would have never understood until again being through it and it's crazy like again when we were saying physical or at least i felt like abuse was just physical and just hearing that it's not and obviously reliving what i went through it's just crazy i don't know i feel like hearing it almost brings like a second um like dimension to it like you can read it but then hearing it vocalized out loud kind of makes it a little bit more real yeah and just knowing that I went through like 90% of the things that you said and I'm like I don't know it just it it almost it's like an out-of-body experience almost like how different life yeah and too I also want to point out like when we sat down to record this you said I find myself like making like minimizing it even yeah. still. Yeah. And so I think that's also important to know. I was just going to say with again you reading that out loud is showing me that no 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 what you went through was real and it's real abuse and this is what happens and to not minimize your experience just because you want to or you feel that you have to whether it's protecting other people or whatever that it may be even protecting myself in some way because i still can't believe i allowed myself to be put in this situation um but yeah yeah so, anyway um again based off of just what she read i i really connected with like 90 percent of what this article said and so i kind of went through picked out what resonated with me And I want to just talk about the experiences that happened with what was mentioned and what it could possibly look like in a relationship and what it looked like in mine. One of them says, an abuser may be pleasant and charming between periods of violence and is often seen as a nice person to others outside of the relationship. So for me, that really played a big role in social media. This was a long distance relationship and so he didn't really get to be around my friends and family all that much, but um, through social media, you would have thought we had the most perfect relationship. Um, and 
I, I don't know if it was because of social media or if there was just a sense that I wanted to believe that what he was saying online or who he was presenting online could be him in real life as well. And so I kind of played up that part of social media. So even if he was, you know, however he was treating me, which we'll get into that later on, however he was treating me in person, if he was praising me online, posting me like, this is the most beautiful girl, wonderful, whatever, whatever. He's looking like the most perfect boyfriend. So I'm feeding into that as well because I want that part of him to be real. And so to everybody, he did seem like the perfect guy, the perfect pair, the perfect in love couple, new it couple. And so social media for that, really, really played um, a part in being a nice person outside of the relationship. The next point on the list was an abuser objectifies the victim and often sees them as their property or sexual objects. And also with the red flags that went on to it, I picked out extreme jealousy and possessiveness to go with that first because that was something that I really really struggled with in the relationship we talk about red flags in relationships all the time and i feel like sometimes we make really you know jokes about it like oh this is that person's red flag or blah 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 but if you really think about it red flags do show up right away and um in the case of jealousy and possessiveness i remember just in our talking stages um we weren't even dating we weren't official we actually hadn't even seen each other yet at this point we were just kind of talking on social media how did you meet Sorry to interrupt you. Um, We met when I was 16 because he was actually talking to my neighbor across the street. And I hate to say this, but I actually didn't like him then. And I thought he was rude and I didn't like their relationship. And this is like somebody who's even to till this day is a really close family friend. Um, So we were close then. We're close now. And I didn't like him then. Um, But then years had passed and we moved away and, you know, grew up a little bit. And I, we found ourselves with mutual friends. And so I just thought, hey, years had passed. Maybe it seemed like we had some common interests. And so that's kind of how we started talking was through social media. Okay, got it. Yeah. Um, because also to preface this, it was a long distance relationship. He no longer lived in the same town as I lived. So social media was basically how we got started. With his presence on social media, I had a different perception of who I thought he was, if that makes sense. So now we're just kind of chit-chatting, talking, getting to know each other, getting to re-know each other, because we didn't even know each other then, we just knew of each other. And so even just in the talking stage, um, I remember I was going to a party with one of my best friends at the time, and he didn't want me to go. And when I asked why, he said because there was going to be other guys there. Now I'm 20 years old, there's going to be other men anywhere I go, anywhere. Um, But his reason was just because he didn't know them, which I tried to reason with at the time where I was like, okay, maybe I can see like you're a little jealous or a little insecure. I get it. You don't know them. But I had reassured him like, no, when you come home and, you know, we meet for the first time. And if you want to meet anybody in my life, like you're more than welcome to meet these people. And that ended up actually like our first fight, which is crazy to say because we weren't even dating. So how are we fighting? Yeah, how long were you talking for at this point? I think about like two weeks. That's wild. I think too, like the age is so important because you said you were 20. Yes. And if I think back to like my mindset at 20 and put myself in your shoes, I feel like if I had a man telling me those things, I would almost be like, you're right. Like, okay, yeah, you know, you would almost be like, oh, you know more than, like I, and me personally, I'd be like, oh, yeah, who am I to tell you that this is wrong? Yeah. I don't know. Like yeah. you're just immature at that age and you don't have as much life experience. You don't have as much dating experience, relationship experience. And especially if you don't even come from a home that showed any of that as an example, um, it, it has to be hard for you to even realize like even that first initial detail right to be able to distinguish that that was wrong yeah and so because I knew it was wrong and I knew that I wasn't doing anything wrong I was just kind of like okay you're not my boyfriend like I kind of had that mentality which I shouldn't even if he was my boyfriend at the time I also shouldn't have somebody telling me like you can't do something it's always it's not what you say it's how you say it 
And so right off the bat, him being like, I don't want you going to this party just because I don't want you to. It was like, Ew. well, I'm going to do it anyway. So, but that was just a red flag that I, you know, when it just went under the rug because I just did what I wanted to anyway. So I didn't really think of it after that. Um, but the jealousy and the possessiveness just only intensified as the relationship grew. I remember when we finally did decide to make it Facebook official and we, we did start dating. Which really quick, can we talk about how important that is? Facebook official. I know. Like for anyone younger than, what, 25? I know. That was a big deal. FBO, baby. That was like, you are official, official. You are official, official. Yeah, so at this point, we're dating now and I'm I'm starting to notice some of the more the red flags just become more prevalent. And me being a 20-year-old girl working at Sephora at the time, and I was surrounded by all females, we talk like a girl, you know, just babes and hey, babe, hey, boo, love you. You know, we just, I don't know. You're, hey, hun, welcome in. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So like all those little pet names, whatever. And so that was like very heavy into my dialogue at the time. And I want to say this was probably like the first or second week that we were dating. No, I want to say it was the first week that we were dating. And we were in a group of friends. And I was like, hey, babe, what's up? And it wasn't directed towards him. It was directed towards the group of friends that we were hanging around. And I'll never forget, he grabbed my arm. And he pulled me to the side and said, I don't ever want you calling anybody babe again. I'm your only babe. And I kind of was like, wait, are you being serious? Because like I just used... To me, babe was just another name for anything and anyone. And I understand that some people may think like babe is strictly meant for a significant other or whatever. But it, it's again how you it's how you say it, not what you're saying. Like he could have easily just afterwards been like, hey, you know what? Like that, that kind of un- made me uncomfortable. Uncomfortable. Yeah. And you'd be like, oh, OK, like I'll just I'll keep that for only my girlfriends because I see like I can't see anybody having an issue with that. Exactly. Well, I mean, maybe he would have, but right. Who knows? But to do it in front of people to pull me off to the side and it was to tell me what to do and to be like, I'm your only babe again, exerting his possessiveness like this is your mind. Mm hmm. And I remember thinking to myself, okay, now this is like the second or third red flag at the time. Within just like a few weeks to a month of knowing yeah, him. Less, yeah, like two weeks of knowing somebody. But I ignored it because in those beginning stages when you're with somebody, they're on their best behavior. And so they're showing you more good than bad with hints of their issues. And so because of that, I wasn't really taking it seriously. I also feel like something like that especially again at that age it can almost come across as like a nice thing like you you're right fear? you are my babe you know no i don't remember that movie okay well anybody who's listening if you've ever watched fear you know exactly what i'm talking about is with mark Wahlberg and reese witherspoon and it is exactly i it's exactly this what we're talking about it's an abusive relationship a guy who's very controlling possessive jealous um takes over her life and tries to murder everybody in it perfect um, but it was things like that. It's like, you just get the little glimpse of, okay, that didn't really sit right with me, but we're having such a good time. And I'm just going to let that slide because maybe you're just feeling off today, but no, it's, it's telling for what's to come. And then of course, as the relationship progressed, the jealousy and possessiveness just got worse. It was to the point that nobody can even look at me if they wanted to. Um, And it would start fights, even just being out in public. One specific time that I can remember, we were out to the bar and we got there super early and we were with a a group of us. It was like some of his family members and friends. And then because we were at this bar super early, there really wasn't anybody there except for just like this other smaller group that was like on the other side of the bar. And there probably was like five guys in their group, but that was it. And this is a big bar. But anyway, we're kind of like in a circle chatting, whatever. And I noticed that he keeps looking back towards the direction of the other people that were here. And it just seemed like it kept happening. And then he would stare a little longer each time. And so I finally looked at him and I was like, what are you looking at? I'm like, what's going on? What's over there? Because he looked irritated. It wasn't just like staring. He looked irritated. And after I asked him that, 
he looks at me and he's saying it to me, but also saying it in their direction, almost to kind of get their attention. He says, that guy over there won't stop fucking looking at you. And I'm like, there's like three people in this bar. What are you talking about? Like, And also look at you. Everyone's going to be looking at you. And like, but it was just so, and I was just like, okay. And so I try to obviously, you know, de-escalate the situation. And I was just like, okay, well, maybe he just looked for a second or like there's not many people in the bar to look at. So he's just kind of looking around his surroundings. And he was like, yeah, well, if he doesn't fucking stop, there's going to be a fucking problem. That was every single time we went out. Mm. And so that now at this point, I'm already kind of deep into the relationship. So when it's happening, it's kind of like this is always a thing. And I not to make excuses for it, but I just kind of always hoped for the best. And so I just kept wanting to not think that this was always going to be this situation, that maybe he was just having an off day. I was just always trying to make excuses for that bad behavior. There was no reason to, for that ever, and it just was constantly. And too, with the long distance relationship, it's, I think that probably puts a different, uh, just, a, just a different perspective on it because I bet, I'm just assuming in your shoes, you're probably like, oh, you know, once we live like in the same town, it's not going to be like this. Like, Absolutely. He's under a lot of stress, whatever, whatever. Absolutely. And so, yeah, I was embarrassed in those moments, but I would just have those little comments in the back of my mind, like maybe we just need to spend more time together. Right. And this will all go away, which was not the case. The next one was the unpredictability. So how did like unpredictability show up? And I feel like that's kind of lumped in with it. his unpredictability kind of went hand in hand with his jealousy and possessiveness because it just really depended on him on that day. So we all know the saying walking on eggshells. That's how I always felt in the relationship, because if he was in a good mood that day, we could be doing the exact same thing. OK, say we went to this exact same restaurant, order this exact same food. But if he was in a good mood that day, it would have been a great experience. But if he was in a bad mood with his jealousy and insecurity, another situation could arise where somebody's looking at me and he wants to make a scene or start a fight because of that. And so all of that was so hard. I didn't know how to act. I didn't know who to be, what to say. If I said the same thing today or tomorrow, I'll get two different reactions from it. And it could be said the exact same way. And so I just never felt like I could do anything right in the relationship because of that. Did you start kind of changing your behavior oh 100 um and so again with this being a long distance relationship i found that i could kind of be two different people just to keep the peace and i don't like that but i had to and so if i knew that he was acting a certain way then i would try to act a way that would make him feel better or i also have a fiery personality so if he's firing at me screaming at me degrading me, whatever that it may be, we're in a fight, an argument. There are times where I'm a fire pistol right back. And then there were just times where I would just shut up and take it, even though that's not in me to allow someone to talk to me or treat me that way. But it was just easier to disassociate in a way and just be like, okay, you're right. Let's just leave. I just felt so, I just, what's, like drained. drained is what I think of like sucking the Just life no, out of you yeah. less of who you are not no life. who you are yeah your life I would okay you went again let's go yeah like whatever you say I don't want because at that point you probably don't want to like escalate it like make it worse and make him more mad depending on what it is that you say or do absolutely how was his uh bad temper with you so again going back to like jealousy and insecurities and possessiveness he had one of the worst tempers that I've ever seen in somebody and just anything can set him off. Obviously I just told you even just somebody staring at me would set him off. Um, and so it was to the point that because he had such a bad temper that we fought every single day. We've, we were in a relationship for just under two years. And when he wasn't away at work where we couldn't maybe talk for a week or two at a time, 
the days we were talking, we were arguing and it could be something super minor or it could be something super major, but every single day was a fight because of his temper. And once he saw red, there was really no going back. Going back to unpredictability, that sucked too because is something going to set you off so bad? It was scary, but being in a long distance relationship, I still felt safe because he wasn't near me. And we'll talk about a bad temper later on as we go down the list. And I'll explain what I mean about safety issues. I never really felt like I had any because we didn't live together and we didn't live in the same town. But there are episodes that did happen while we were together. And then that is when I did the bad temper really escalated and my safety was an issue. How often did you see him? Because, you you know, when I when I think long distance, I think, oh, you never see him. But like, yeah. did you see him like once a month, once every couple months? So I think if I really think back to it, I think I saw him once every three months. OK. And he would come back home. Yes. Okay. And I would go and visit him. OK. So every and I think we would flip flop. So maybe he would be home every six months. And then so he'd be home one one time I would go out three months and then three months he'd come back. Okay. And sometimes we might be able to sneak an, you know, another visit in between, but it would be me going to see him. Okay. And were the visits like a week long, two weeks long? Some of them could be like three days. I know, I think one of the longest ones was like 10 days I was out there. Okay. But for the majority, if he came home, it was for a week or, or around a week. And then if I went to see him, it could have been two, three days, up to 10 days. That was one of the longest times that I saw him. That's another reason why I downplay. I feel like I downplay this a lot because we weren't together 24 seven. And I think to myself, would things be different if we were? Would things, would this relationship, would it, would hit it, would it have ended sooner? Or would things escalated quicker to the point where And I don't like speculating. I really, really don't. But there were times where I did fear my life. Yeah. I'm just going to put it that way. Well, especially there's something that would something, something else, have happened to me. Yeah. 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 And also like even just you said you weren't um, living together yet. But, um, you know, if you would have gotten married or if you would have had a baby or something, I feel yeah. like those things are extra layers to it yes. that make it harder to leave a situation. And so... You know, when you put it that way of if you lived in the same town, would you have left sooner or would the relationship have escalated and gotten more serious because it did get serious very quickly as it was? Yes. Would something like that happening add to it and make it almost like you couldn't leave even more? Mm -hmm. Talking about like bad temper and our arguments, some of our arguments were based on the, the fact that I wouldn't leave where I was from to live with him. And it was because I knew deep down that if I were to leave my situation, would I ever come back? Mm. I thought about that all the time and I made excuses all the time why I couldn't live with him. Like, oh no, like because I have school still and I'll see you after this or blah, blah, blah. But it was solely because I didn't know if I'd come back. Yeah. And I think that's one of the scariest places you could be. And again, when I think about it, I'm like, if I was that scared, why did I stay? And uh, we're going to talk about that more into the episode as well, because just even the little bit we've talked about, I'm already like annoyed at myself. Like, I'm like, why did I even, why didn't I leave? You know what I mean? Or like what? But it, it, it it's far more complicated than that. And I think that's why abusers get away with what they do and people end up staying in relationships longer than they need to because this isn't just one day it's over time and the manipulation is so intense Mm -hmm. that i think it's easy from an outsider who hasn't been in abuse in an in an abusive relationship or experienced it or witnessed it to be like well that's dumb why didn't you just leave it's there's so many layers to it aspects to it and the manipulation really gets you to your core yes to where like right now you're reading that and you're like i'm annoyed at myself Mm -hmm. but it makes sense like the more we get into it and you know especially too when you're younger especially um but also too i mean like we were talking about like having kids and being married like i can see 
also like being older and like using that as like reasons why we like why women and yeah. men stay yeah so it make it makes sense yeah i do like to say i am i feel like on the luckier spectrum because there were no kids there were no marriage i wasn't financially tied to this person um if i left i wasn't homeless and so there's a lot of factors that go into why people stay with their abusers and i'm just very blessed that that wasn't me and i know i think that's why it caused so much more um, anguish in the relationship because I had so much pushback because I wouldn't allow myself to get to that point of complete vulnerability. I always still had somewhat of a, a guard up yeah, that protected me from really putting myself in a situation that I might not come back from. And that probably really pissed him off. Oh, absolutely. Okay, so the next thing was... They blame their violence on circumstances such as stress, their partner's behavior, a bad day, alcohol, drugs, or other factors. So I think this is what really kind of plays a key role in why I stayed from the beginning, even though I had noticed some of the red flags from the start. And it's because obviously when you're getting to know each other, I mean, we shared some deep, intimate things about our past and how we grew up. And from his perspective it wasn't it wasn't something that you would wish on a child growing up very traumatic experiences and so oftentimes he would blame the reason why he acted the way he acted was because of how he grew up and knowing that and knowing the information behind it i always just had a soft spot for him Mm -hmm. i i felt like he didn't get the love that he deserved that every child deserves growing up and so i wanted to be that for him i saw it as an opportunity where like you know what i want you to know that you're enough i want you to know that you're loved you're cared for you're supported for and so no matter how much or how badly he would treat me i would always resort back to you're right the situation you came from and even the situation he was in wasn't that pleasant. And so I just constantly made excuses for that and just was like, you're right. You're right. You know what? We will get through this. I'll be there. I'll be your support system. If I keep showing you love, you'll get it eventually. I also feel like women are very, number one, we're very nurturing. Mm -hmm. Number two, we're very fix it. Yeah. So um, especially in situations like that. So it makes sense where it's like almost like, not to say you thought this but to be like okay he's broken this is why he's doing this if we can just fix this we're perfect exactly you know the the 50 percent of your relationship that showed good would eventually become a hundred percent you know absolutely That's how it can be seen no and i for sure felt that way why as a 20 year old girl did i think like i had the ability to fix someone's lifelong trauma I because think too, I don't like, know. We don't really, I feel like back then too, it wasn't really known like, hey, let's like go to therapy and like unpack that then. For sure. You know, not to say like, cause like n- putting like the abuse aside, someone who is going through that kind of stuff can go and work through their issues and um, in turn treat people better in their life. Yeah. Um, I also feel like, just, so like back then, I just think therapy being as well known and talked about just like wasn't it wasn't a thing especially for men i think no you know it's a little bit more taboo and i feel like men kind of have this hard exterior as is where they're like they're i'm i'm who i am there's no fixing me you just kind of got to deal with it like they don't want to talk about problems no they don't want to which (laughs) i think we can all agree that maybe we should (laughs) maybe we should in that i mean so much verbal abuse um came from that and again another red flag that i saw right from the get-go i want to say this is in the first week that we were started we started dating he called me a bitch and i don't even know what i could have done within the first week of us talking that even labeled me as a like to be actually called like a fucking bitch to me and now i'm i'm a trucker i i i you know i got a pretty dirty mouth um so i'm not gonna be like nobody can swear at me but swearing is different than name calling exactly and 
what possessed him just to be like you're a fucking bitch um within the first week of us talking i don't i don't know and that was just small amount of what i was about to endure the rest of the entire relationship you know i remember the first week just even calling me a bitch let's just get that straight you can do anything to me but as soon as you start calling me names i was like i'm done like i don't want it i'm not gonna sit and allow you to talk to me this way this is not what I want in a relationship whatsoever. And that's exactly what I said to him. It was like the end of the first week of us actually officially dating. And I was like, y- you're telling me I can't go to parties. You're you're telling me I have to change my verbiage and how I talk to people. And now you're calling me a bitch. I've done nothing to you but be so welcoming and like warm to you being here and like us meeting for the first time. And this is how you're treating me. And I'll never forget that he got down on his knees, started crying and saying, again pouring out these are the reasons why i'm so sorry like i grew up this way like you don't deserve that i promise i'll never talk to you like this again and seeing a man just like open up and be vulnerable and cry the crying is what got me i've never seen a grown man cry before and he really looked apologetic or seemed that way and it's like how do you even just in that one instance write somebody off they did it they're apologizing for it. am i just meant to be like nope sorry right done right or do i give it a chance like okay maybe they are having an off day and now they know my boundary they know that they're not going to cross that again and we can move forward with the relationship and i felt i was stuck in that moment every single time where like something new would happen a new name would be called or a new you can't do this or you can't do that and i was left with here's my boundary don't cross it and if you cross it we're done And then it was, you're right, I'm sorry, I won't do that again. And so then I give another chance, only for it to be worse and worse and worse each and every single time. Okay, so it was, would you say that it was more of like him just apologizing and asking for forgiveness more than like poo-pooing your experience? Yes, it was always, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Until the end. Yeah. Until the end. Oh, okay. Yeah. It was very much apologetic, very much, I will change. I don't want to treat you this way. Please stay with me. And making promises for your future. Making promises, which we'll also get into that too. And I just kept saying, okay, okay, okay. Until I was in the thick of it. And it was no longer, I'm sorry. It was, well, too fucking bad. Deal with it, bitch. Oh, fuck. Yeah. What were like some of the things that he would call you later on, like besides just bitch? Um, you know what? This man has called me every name under the sun. There, you know, when we say like sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. It wasn't until that relationship that I I realized that words actually do really hurt. But also because I was called every name under the sun, now they really don't have as much meaning anymore in a weird way, if that makes any sense. You built up a little callus. I had to, um, because in every form I mean, anything that you could ever say to a woman, he said to me, I mean, I was a slut. I was a whore. I was a bitch. I was a cunt. I was attention whore. That was like one of his favorite things to call me. Just like anything that you can call a woman, he would call me. I'm just like, it's just like singing a song of insecurity. Just so insecure. It It was so easy for him to say bitch as easy it was for him to call me babe. Sure, it was probably said in the same sentence at you, one point. You know how they say, like, oh, I had the ick. Like, just now, ick. <laughs> Complete ick. Absolutely. So he was very, very heavy on the verbal abuse, always swearing at me, always calling me some sort of name. And then at one point, again, most of our relationship was spent through the phone because we were a long-distance relationship. We were getting into a fight, as always. And my mom stepped into it. And she's just like, all right, it's enough you know, kind of situation. And I remember he told her to shut the fuck up. Oh my God. Wait, tell me about this. Yeah. We haven't talked about this one yet. Yeah, we were, I was in my room as any 20 year old would be. I don't even know if I was 20, 21 at the time. It's all a blur at this point, but I was in my early 20s. So somewhere between 20 and 22. And we just, again, were on FaceTime fighting like per usual. And my mom just came in the room and my parents always like came in and sat on my bed, like hung out and like saw what I was doing or whatever. And that's what my mom did a lot. She would always just come in, lay in bed with me and be like, oh, who are you talking to? Or blah, blah, blah. And 
obviously he's my boyfriend so she came and lay down and what's going on blah 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 we were in an argument i said my side he said his side and she was just like of course my mom is gonna stick up for me too and just even giving the little bit of information you can tell that this person was not pleasant to be with and so sometimes an outsider's perspective of being like okay you need to relax you need to chill and you need to not talk to her that way she gave her two cents and he told her to shut the fuck up and i was like okay first of all you can talk to me that way and i don't want you to but like i'm not gonna allow you to talk to my mom that way yeah. or anybody close to me in my family like that and he was like well she should mind her own fucking business that was what it was constantly and that's not like you're shocked and i'm not not to Gina. Not to Gina. <laughs> My mom, if she could, she would have went right through that fucking no. phone and wanted to beat his ass. You know what's so funny? He would <laughs> never have done that in person. Can you imagine? Or do that to your dad? Can yeah. you fucking imagine? No. I would love to see your My dad, dad would kick lay his the ass. Fuck out. Yeah. Literally just one swipe. Done. Done. On the ground. Um, but that was... So like kind of getting a little off topic here. Well, not really. But a lot of his anger bad temper and his verbal abuse he had an ego where he felt like he was bigger and badder than everybody else and so that's another reason why i felt like he felt like he can get away with saying those things to people and i mean i've watched him do it in in front of other people now was he ever given the opportunity to do it in front of my parents no but i wouldn't put it past him Mm. like i think if he was given the opportunity to say something off the wall to my dad i think he would have Wow. But he was just never given that opportunity. Yeah. And obviously, he's doing it to my mom on FaceTime. And That's I've, fucking I've wild. just watched him disrespect everybody in his entire life. Like, what? who cares about my mom? You know, to him, that's no different. He thinks he's the biggest and the baddest in the in the game. So I can say whatever the fuck I want to say to whoever I want to say it to. And too, like, again, he, he was very possessive. So he saw you as your, as his. Yeah. So for his, for his perspective, he's probably like, who the fuck are you? This is my yes. girl. No, 100%. Yeah. And that's why. And first of all, no, my, my business is my mom's business. It's my mom. It's whoever's business you want it to be it, because it, it's your business. It's exactly. And like, but with an abuser in just their whole goal is to have everybody turn against you. And so that was just his way to nitpick off my family, my friends. He can talk to them however the fuck he wants to. And then once someone's being disrespected by him, they're like, okay, well, I'm not going to deal with you. And that's exactly what he wanted. He doesn't want anybody dealing with me or with him. The other thing, too, which maybe I'm skipping ahead, but with, like, making other people, like, like distancing you from them and mm-hmm. making it so that you didn't have as many friends or as many people in your close circle so that yeah. he had more control over you. Yeah. I'm not explaining this experience in a chronological order. I'm just going based off of what the website says and just telling my experience. This could be in the beginning of the re- the relationship. This could be the on the middle. I'm just, because it's been so long, it's been 10 years, a lot of my memories are scattered brain. I can't really pinpoint when things happened when they did i just know that they happened and there's a lot of things that might be even worse than the things that i'm talking about but i just do not remember and you were telling me too like you had a friend bring up something that happened and you were like i completely blocked that out i don't even remember that but yeah yeah, now that you say that i remember yeah um she was like triggered like something had like triggered her memory where she was like oh my god i forgot that this you know, do you remember this? Because like this just popped in my brain right now. And I was like, no, what are you talking about? That that was me. That was my relationship. And she's like, how do you not remember that? That was so awful because it was awful for her to remember. But because all of my memories were surrounded by awful times Mm -hmm. and they were consistent, there's just things that I completely have blacked out in my memory. And I think it's very common for like when you're going through like a traumatic experience, mm-hmm. your brain will try to protect you. It does. And so it's very possible to have like a repressed memory that like you yeah. don't even know about. Yeah. I've heard of that before from people in my personal life. Absolutely. That, you know, you're, you're just, your body's trying to protect itself. Oh, absolutely. And again, I it's just so hard to talk about verbal abuse without reading it or going through it um and i mean this has been 10 years so i don't have you know text messages saved or anything like that um but one of my memories that i do remember and this was right around the time where we did finally end up breaking up 
one of my best friends, she came home. She went to college in St. Louis. And so I didn't get to see her as much. And our whole relationship, like she was gone away at college. And so when the relationship ended and she came home, she was like, okay, fill me in. What's going on? And we were sitting on my bed and I just give her my phone. And I was like, this is the best way that I can explain it to you. You can just read through the text messages. And I just remember after two minutes of her reading, she just starts bawling her eyes out. And I just remember, like, that's actually going to make me cry. No, that's so sweet, though. Like, just the love that you can feel from, like, your friends. Yeah. And I just remember her sitting on my bed crying. And she was like, how can someone talk to you this way? And I remember just looking at her so stone cold. Like, what do you mean? This yeah, is like, like you're used to it. I was so used to it at that point that I was like, this is just an average Sunday afternoon for me. Yeah. And but just seeing her hurt, I was like, holy shit, this really is a lot worse than I thought that it was. But again, at that point, it had already been two years into the relationship. And so I was calloused. I just I didn't care you know, anything that was said to me, I just was like, okay. And so was this, your, so this was your first time telling her like what you were going through? Sounds like. Pretty much. Um, all of my best friends lived away at college because we were in our twenties and our early twenties. And so there was only one friend that really like, she was my ride or die. She knew everything. And I always, I don't know how I could have made honestly through that time without her. So she knew everything. And I think because it was my one go to person, I felt like if I had her, that was all I needed to tell because at least somebody knew. It's almost like you didn't want so many cooks in the kitchen, like giving yes. you advice and opinions and things when especially like in your gut, you knew it was wrong. Yeah. But at the same time, it's like you weren't deciding to leave either. No. So then you also didn't want to have to like tell them like like stick up for him or like whatever and because I was so hot and cold because I was just so determined to fix this always fix this like I have it in me I know I can fix this I even though it was bad in the moment I didn't want other people knowing because I was gonna go back I was gonna continue the relationship and that would have honestly probably deteriorated my friendships because they're like I'm sick and tired of you having someone treat you like this and I'm knowing this because you're the one telling me and you keep going back to this person yeah it would have 100% ruined our relationship maybe not you know I can't speculate that part like my friends are I'm very blessed with the best of friends in the world but you just don't know and maybe they would have been like I'm tired of hearing it and then I would have really felt alone when more and more were to have happened so it was nice to have that one friend that I just told everything to and just at least get it off my chest because then if something did happen, I had a witness. Yeah. It was almost like I had a little side witness of like, she knows everything that went down. Yeah. And what was she telling you during this? Like when you were explaining things to her, and did you tell her everything? Oh, I told her everything. Okay. Yeah. Everything. And even with giving some little parts to my other best friends as well, every single one of us were going through something similar oh wow yes wow crazy so I don't want to say whose was worse than the other but like we all were dating losers at the same time and so some I know one of them was physical abusive to her Mm. mine was very mentally emotionally verbally um and then I know like other sides of losers where he was just like playing her and just like maybe wasn't verbally abusing her but was just being a shit person to her and so we all just kind of found ourselves in just like shitty relationships. So that probably just felt normal. It I would really think. did. It, no, it really did. I, I At one point I was like, is this what relationships are supposed to be like? Yeah. Because my core group of friends were in it. Wow. And again, maybe not all the same severity, but l- different levels of like, wow, all men actually kind of suck. And I, I would think too, then in your shoes, when you're dealing with what you're going through and you hear of a friend who's boyfriend's cheating on her and like doing all the things uh, whatever it is you could almost be like oh I can handle this because he's not doing xyz like it can almost seem like even even if the things that that boyfriend is doing Mm -hmm. is just as bad yep you can maybe think in your head well I can handle what I'm handling yep and after actually after our breakup 
one of my best friends had found herself in a similar relationship that I had just gotten out of. And she really liked him. And he, just like all most abusers, like they have a really good side to them that you like being around. So I didn't totally hate this dude. But there were red flags that I would see where I'm like, oh my God, this is just like my ex. And I'm watching my best friend go through this. Mm -hmm. And so because we were all close, I would sometimes pull him to the side and be like, listen, like I know that you might be jealous or insecure or you have these feelings about, you know, my best friend, but like she's in it and like you don't have to worry about these things. So I just want to see you guys succeed in the relationship and I want to just see you kind of chill out a little bit, relax, like everything's good. And I thought that I can put my own two cents in trying to save another relationship instead of just seeing what he was for who he was which was just a piece of shit yeah and thank god like that relationship didn't last longer either but i think she was probably in a relationship with him for like a year and a half and so but i just kept that's even like another story about her whole and i don't want to get into her relationship but because i had just gotten out of mine i would just it was like seeing mine again oh yeah like from a different perspective it, yeah and i was so much more harsh oh yeah you're probably like nope drop him stop leave him yeah i remember going out to my birthday and he wouldn't allow like me and all of our girls we were dancing he wouldn't allow her to dance with us because he was jealous and insecure <laughs> and i remember being like you're a piece of shit you could leave my party but I, then she would have left with him oh yeah so and then been mad to, at you yeah. for yeah so she had to stand there and watch me dance on my birthday why she stood next to him just to to make sure that they didn't have a fight and i was like oh my god that was me how embarrassing yeah it's like almost like you got like more of an insight into your own relationship mm-hmm. even though you lived it yep. you're now seeing it from a different view yep where it's just like so clear yep the other thing i wanted to say is you mentioned like the whole fix it thing like you wanted to fix this relationship and so you couldn't tell people because you know you're working on it yeah I want to mention, too, that you've said, like, how he made it clear that, like, yeah, he was going to do things to change and whatever. But also you, it was up to you to be patient. Yeah. And it's up to you to yes. also be there right. in the relationship in the thick of it or whatever. Mm-hmm. So I can see why you've you've had that pressure on yourself and felt that way. Yeah, for sure. Because then it would make me look as like I failed the relationship. And an ego never wants that. They want to be chosen. They want to be the fix it, the do all, the person that did it. And my ego was so, so bad then. And I was just determined to make this relationship work no matter the cost of my own life. Okay, so the next point was extremely controlling behavior. So how how was he controlling with you in the relationship? So I think starting in the beginning... Um, again, telling me like, you know, you can't call anybody babe, but me that was showing some control there telling me I cannot, cannot go to a party. That's showing some control there. But now that we're in the relationship, he's really starting to double down on what I can and cannot do. And so it started with basically men in my life. So if there were anybody outside of my circle, cause I did have like two really good guy friends at the time. And I remember being like, these are my best guy friends and there's nothing that you can or will do that will ever kick them out of my life. And if you have a problem with that, I will leave you. And for whatever reason, that was like the one rule he was like, fine. I don't know why, but anyway, it was. And again, like the hot and cold, like walking on eggshells. You don't know what's going to like tip him off and make him piss. Exactly. But everybody else fair game. They were out of my life. So one by one, he would have me delete people off social media because he was uncomfortable with them. Even just being friends with me on social media through Snapchat, very much isolating me in that sense. And he just put it in a way where it's like, well, they just want to get with you and I just don't trust them and blah, 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 blah. And so again, to not have an argument, I would just delete people off Facebook. And if he told me to delete somebody off Facebook and I didn't have them deleted and he saw them in my comments or whatever, he would literally start fights under my posts, whether it was pictures or statuses. And, you know, thankfully with the um, the Facebook memories that pop up, he's blocked on my social media. So whatever. But there was like a, a time where even if somebody was blocked, you can still see their comments on your stuff 
And I would just be reminded like, oh my God, here's him fighting some man in the comments just because for nothing, for literally nothing. Um, and so it caused a divide against even just like social media friends. And so he kicks out everybody that was outside of my circle to get me into a smaller, smaller circle and then eventually would just be nothing. Thankfully, I never got into that position, but I know that other people do. I know other people fall into like losing their family and friends and like only relying on him, but that was the path that he was taking. He was trying to slowly knock one person off the list until there wasn't anybody. I hate that we're jumping around, but I feel like that was just the only way that I can get all these little um, pieces down. Well, because like you said, like you don't remember it even clearly and chronologically. So mm-hmm. if you like tried to explain it, we'd end up having to go back around anyway. So I'm glad we're doing it this way because it's breaking down the abuse and yes. not the relationship. It's not going through like, okay, tell me all about your relationship. It's We're going to talk about the abuse in this relationship right. and how it showed up for you. So I'm going to lump because it says extremely co- controlling behavior, but it also talks about controlling finances and also con- um, talks about controlling of what the victim wears and how they act. So I'm just going to kind of lump all of that into one. So again, with the controlling behavior, starting with social media, who and who I cannot talk to or who I cannot be friends with on social media, as far as what it looked like even outside after the relationship, after we broke up for six months post breakup, he was still trying to control me on who I can talk to, who I could be friends with. After we broke up, he was like, these are my friends and these are your friends and nobody could ever talk to you ever again, which just wasn't realistic because a lot of people were mutuals too that kind of were both of our friends and and he wasn't, they weren't gonna just go with the divide of like, well, just because you guys broke up doesn't mean I can't still like her or be her friend or talk to her. But that's just what abusers do. They want to control everybody in your life and your surrounding who talks to you. And even till this day tells people to delete me off social media, which is so weird. It's just so weird. It's been 10 years. Exactly. It's been 10 years and he is still yeah being controlling yeah and in some aspect yes and just two years ago um a mutual friend of ours i'm a professional makeup artist if some of you don't already know that i do makeup for a living and i did this girl's makeup for a photo shoot and she's somebody who doesn't really like post a lot of selfies or um just about herself at all. And when I did her makeup, she was like, oh my God, this is the most beautiful I've ever felt. Like you are amazing. I remember she went home, she posted a selfie, she tagged me and was like, everybody get your makeup done by her. She's the best. She's beautiful. And lo and behold, he slipped into her DMs to control her and tell her um, to not support me, that I'm trash um, and to not be my friend. And she was just kind of like, First of all, it's been like eight years since you guys broke up. Like she's my friend too. Here still to this day, because you know he's blocked on my end, he can't really reach out to me and control me. He's controlling other people around me and who can talk to me, which is weird because she's like, this is my friend. What do you mean I can't talk to her? When she told him that she wasn't gonna get in the middle of it and just to leave it alone, he just progressed on to why she shouldn't talk to me, which is just bizarre. This is a married woman. Yeah. Like, just, I don't know why that matters, but I just think it's like, like, what are you, what are you doing? Exactly. And isn't this, we can cut this out if you want, but isn't he married too at this point? Yes. Like, like, you guys are, I just, I don't get it. But, uh, you know, going back to the beginning of the article, when it states that abusers control their current and past Mm. relationships yeah it clearly doesn't matter that 10 years have passed that i'm still being he's still trying to like puppeteer things in life and destroy me yeah because he couldn't actually end up destroying he never ended up destroying me i moved past it but it's still i guess a goal of his yeah anyway um, and then c- controlling finances again. We didn't live together. 
And so I, I can't even imagine what it would be like living with somebody and having shared finances. But boy, did he have something to say about how I spent my money. I it didn't matter what I spent my money on. He always had a problem with it. Um, and especially when I spent my money on makeup, being in the makeup industry, I was working at Sephora all the, t- you know, at the time and a new palette would come out and I'd buy it. We get a discount. I'd save some money and I'd be so excited about it. And I'm like, look what I bought today. And it was just always met with like, why are you buying or why are you spending your money on things that you don't need to be spending it on? We have a future to be thinking about. And it always went back to this future. You know, whether we were in a fight and I didn't want to be with him because of his actions and he, I promise in the future I'll be better. Or I can't spend my money the way I want to because I need to be thinking about the future. I think one key part about his abuse was it was never allowed to live in the moment. And so I think a part of me was always never in the present So like, even though presently he was obviously treating me like dog shit, I kept thinking, well, what's the future going to look like? And so I just kept disregarding everything that was happening in the present because you're right, I have a future to think about, or this is in the future, or things will change in the future, will be better in the future. Again, just that was a huge part of why I stayed for as long as I did. So they don't keep you in the present. If, If I was in the present moment and I was being treated like shit, I would have just walked away and never talked to you ever again. But the dangling of your past and your future really kind of just warped what the present looked like. Yeah. If that makes any sense. No, for sure. And then controlling of what I wear, which was so weird because, and like going back to social media where we talk about social media is fake. I was always met with what I could and could not wear, but say I would wear the same thing or like post it on social media, on social media, it was praised. And so meeting with that confusion of which part of you am I going to get? Like, are you actually just, do you not like what I'm wearing because you wanted to start a fight? Because on here online, you're saying I look beautiful and you love what I'm wearing. So it was always, it was just, I don't even know how to explain how confused I was, but I never gave in to what he said I couldn't, couldn't wear. And I know I brought up to you one instance that like, you know, burned in your brain burned in my brain was for new year's i loved i still like dressing up for new year but this was new year's and i wanted to look my absolute best we couldn't be together this new year's just like most of our relationship but i still want to dress up and go out because there was a party and i was gonna go and so i remember i bought this top from windsor it was a black top the front of it was gold sequin sparkly. And I was in my gold era at that point. Like I still am. I love gold. But like then I was like, gold is in. I, I felt like that girl. So it's this black top with gold sequin sparkly in the front. The back had a little bit of an opening and like the little lower midsection. Probably like a fourth of my back was showing. I had long black jeans on and black high heels. And I was just feeling the best. I was that girl. But... I was met with, I couldn't wear that shirt. How did he know what you were wearing? Did you FaceTime oh, yeah, him we before always, or something? Yeah, okay. we always FaceTimed. And I think that was, it was just, it was such a strange relationship because there'd be times where I would, sh- whether I talked to him or showed him something and it would be fine in one moment and in one moment in time. And then the next, they wouldn't be fine. And so he always know he knows what I wear. Because one, I'm posting it on social media. I'm showing him. We FaceTime. He he knows my wardrobe. I'm not hiding it. And so I was excited for my New Year's outfit. And I FaceTime and I showed him what I was going to wear. And he got pissed off at me for wanting to wear that outfit. And I said, why? Which also. What about this outfit is making you angry? I feel like we should post a picture of you in the outfit on Instagram. We should. Because you're literally, first of all, covered from your neck to your ankles and even on the back you're fully covered except for the little bit of your lower back yeah and when i asked him okay what is wrong with this top he said because your back is showing i said the one part of this little itty part of my back is showing and you have a problem with that he said yeah because it looks like you want to be single i'm like i look like you sound like you want to be single but it's like i (laughs) First of all, my outfit's not giving single. It's giving New Year's bad bitch. And yeah. like, I don't, what do you mean? 
but it was always, he always wanted to warp my mentality. He wanted to warp how I viewed things and he wanted it to be as negative as he saw anything because that was him. He had just one of the most awful, negative, just glass half empty type of personality. And if he can find something to nitpick on, he would. I could have probably worn that in the beginning of our relationship and he would have been like, oh my God, this is like the most beautiful shirt you've ever worn. Mm -hmm. But now it's a problem six months in. It was just like, I and and going back and forth of, I just felt like I was fighting for my life constantly that I have such a rebellious personality that really played a huge role in the relationship because I just, at, at some point, just stopped caring. I'm like, you have no rhyme or reason of why you're actually upset with what I'm wearing, what I'm buying, who I'm hanging out with, where I'm going. You just want to be fucking pissed off just to be miserable. And so once I realized that, I was like, I'm going to do whatever I want. And I told Brie, I was like, because I pulled it up on Facebook. I was like, she's like, did you ever post a picture of that outfit? I was like, I sure did. And it was a back photo. It was me I with my back it. facing the mirror and it was a it was a mirror shot of my back that I he was it. so pissed off about and what did i do click put it on facebook and it said nye with a heart because that was i just at some points i'm like you gotta give up you captioned it single and ready to mingle yeah i should <laughs> i really kidding. fucking should have you know i could go change that back right now right single oh, ready to mingle. that would be so funny <laughs> but it's so yeah it was just constantly and because I wanted to wear that outfit, I was I was quote unquote single. I was an attention whore. I was a slut. Who am I trying to look good for? That was one of his notorious lines. Who are you trying to look good for? If I ever wanted to dress nice, if I ever wanted to touch up my makeup after a nine hour shift before I went and hung out with my friends, who are you trying to look good for? My fucking self, bitch. Literally. Literally like my I'm a fucking self. Thank you. So the controlling was just like any chance he can slip on in, whether that was who I talked with, who I hung out with, social media. Again, he didn't control necessarily my finances, but he had a problem with everything I spent my money on. Sounds like he had a problem with fucking everything. No, absolutely. Depending on his mood. Depending on the mood. Absolutely. Which, you know, now going into talking about, because I said, who are, you know, who are you trying to look good for? That was one of his number one things. Um, the next thing is accusations of the victim flirting with others or having an affair. Since the day we started talking, he held my past against me. People that I had talked to or hooked up with prior to being into that relationship was dangled over my head for two years. And of course, it was always, I'm sorry, I won't do that again until he did that again. I'm sorry, I won't do that again until he, he never let me live things down, which was just, I don't know, maybe part of the controlling behavior, obviously part of insecurity, but like I couldn't change my past. So I don't know what he wanted from me other than just to demoralize me and just keep finding issues with me to be mad at. It's almost like he just wanted to make you feel small so that he Always. felt big. Always. And I'm glad that you actually brought that up because I feel like towards the end of the relationship, I know I had a conversation with him about this. I was just like, and, and other people saw it this way too. I felt like he was in constant competition with me, mm. which is so weird to say. I think that's common in some relationships. Yeah. I've seen that just randomly, not even in like abusive relationships necessarily, yeah. but just in couples I've seen it and I'm like that's weird I like because I've never <laughs> experienced that right. I'm like that's so weird and like but, and, yeah. and, and you know hindsight now me being in the relationship that I'm in like the way me and Jake uplift each other and like yeah. try to bring out the very very best in each other I just couldn't imagine dating somebody and thinking they're the enemy and like who I'm supposed to compete against because like in our relationships, if he's winning, I'm winning. Exactly. If I'm winning, he's, he's winning. winning. Absolutely. Now sp I can speak on this 10 years later because things eventually come to light. What was said, I never really like 
during the relationship and, and slightly after the relationship, I never really dug for information of how he was like talking about me to other people. But I did find that out like years later. Um, he made like full on lies about me to others about cheating or having affairs or flirting and things like that. So let me let me just break that down. I remember this wasn't I can't remember when this person had told me this, but when me and her were on the subject of the relationship, why we broke up, whatever, whatever, she hit me with, well, you know, well, he told me that you, you know, when you would go out at the bar, like you would sit and have drinks with men you don't know for like 45 minutes. And I was blown away. And I'm like, he said that about me? And she was like, yeah, and you did that all the time. (laughs) And I was like, so not only are you accusing me of cheating line or whatever, you're trying to convince other people that I was a liar, a cheater. I was having affairs. I was doing all these things. And it, it clicked to me why he was doing that. It was to justify his shit behavior. Yeah. Because if they saw him talking down to me or treating me like shit, well, I remember what you told me, what Amanda does to you. So, I mean, I, I don't it. agree. Yeah. But, like, I get it. Yeah. What a piece so of shit. So, he was manipulating people around me to not like me so that they couldn't stick up for me in times of actual fucking need. Well, same thing with, like, the competition thing. I bet he wants to, like, make you seem so awful, too, just to make him look even better, yeah. even aside from the abuse, just mm-hmm. in general. Yeah. And another time that I remember was for my 22nd birthday. We had a huge group of people going. I was somebody who loved celebrating their birthdays up until probably like COVID. Like I always got a big group of people. Well, actually until my 30th because we, you know, we had fun that. We did that. Um, But I've always been the type of person where I love my birthdays. I love getting a big group of people and celebrating my birthday. And we did that at this bar, I don't want to say a local bar. We did this at one of the biggest bars in our local area. And I think I had like 40 people meeting me up for my birthday. And so we're, this bar is made up of multiple bars. And so we're like in one of the biggest parts of the bars and just everybody's slowly, you know, coming in, hugging me, doing whatever. And at one point, I don't even remember if this, I think this was like towards the middle end of the night. Um, cause people were coming in as they went, like not everybody showed up at the same time. And this one guy comes up to me and it was a big surprise. And I was like, oh my God, hello, how are you? He gives me a really big hug. He says, happy birthday. Do you want me to buy you a drink? And I was like, sure. So we went to the table to grab our, you know, whether it was like a shot or a drink. I don't know. That's what it was. I see him having a complete meltdown attitude. And I walk over to him and I'm like, what's going on? Why are you upset? And he said, because that guy over there, you were all hugged up on holding hands and walking around the bar with. And I was like, who? Because this is so far fetched. Like, first of all, you're here, you know, like if I were to have done that, do you think I would have done that in front of him? Right. If I were to have done that. even Well, even if, say you did, say yeah. you were hugging him or holding like linked arms linked or whatever. Arm, yes. If you're doing it in front of him, like, again, like you weren't, but even if you were, it would show even more, like, this is my friend. But my boyfriend's here. He's this literally right here. Yeah. So, anyway, ends up making up this lie to him because that's his perception. He wants to see everything negatively. So he was like, no, I saw you. You're fucking holding hands with him. And you, there's something fucking going on. You know, now just honestly starting a fight in the middle of this bar. And it's my birthday. So he walks off in a fit of rage. I go after him because he, in a fit of rage, was like, I'm going to go dance with these girls in the middle of the bar. And I was just like, going back. On your birthday again, on your birthday. Going back to the perception, okay, of these are things that I don't do. And he's convincing people that I do. And here's him showing what he actually does. So now he's walking. He's going to go walk off and dance with a group of girls to make me jealous because I hugged another guy on my birthday. And so I I take after him and I'm like, okay, 
can we not? Can we stop fighting? Can you turn around? Can you talk to me? Because I want to talk about it. Like, why are you rush, rushing off and like going to go run after a group of girls? I tug at him. He whips around, twists my fucking wrist. And this is the first time that he's actually publicly put his hands on me. Twisted my wrist. I instantly, my drink flew out of my hand, shattered all over the ground. I felt like he fucking broke my wrist and I ran to the bathroom. And that's how that night ended. Me bawling my eyes out in a bathroom because he's con- the constant fight, the constant, you're, you're wanting attention, you're flirting with other people, always making up stories that weren't happening. And again, when I think about why he that was his perception or why he did some of the things he did. I truly believe he hated the way people loved me. Oh yeah. Well, yeah, that he was jealous of you. I think going back to the competition, jealous of me because I'm loved by money and it, it was always sought out as a problem. No, no, no. People love you because you're an attention whore. Yeah. People love you because you're a slut. That's not true. Yeah. That's the furthest from the truth. Which makes sense even more why he wanted to like break you down so much. Every time. And again, with my personality being as resilient as it was and being as rebellious as it was, I was like, you can keep doing all these things and you can keep you can keep making this difficult for yourself, but I'm not going to stop being the loving, bubbly, outgoing, friendly person that I am. Yeah, and like, not like he should even be with anybody, but it's like, why don't you just find yourself like a glass half empty, not bubbly person to be with? But I also don't think that he should be with anybody. But going back to like not wanting me to be who I was, even though from the get go, he quote unquote loved everything about me. He used to make an excuse and say, why don't you be more like your sister? Oh, what a weird thing to say. Um, And if... You don't know my sister. My sister is like the twin blonde version of me, but she's more of the soft-spoken. She's not the wild, rebellious child. I mean, but don't get it wrong. She's sometimes got a bigger attitude than I do, and I don't think most people know that unless you really know her. I'm more verbal about who I am. She's more private about it. Um, But to me, what I think he was trying to say was he wanted me to be quiet. He didn't want me being this outgoing, loving, wild child that he quote unquote fell in love with. He just wanted to break me down inch by inch and mold me to who he wanted me to be, which I don't even know what that was. Well, and I think it made him very uncomfortable that a lot of people like you. Yeah. And still, obviously, it's intimidating to him, obviously, to this day. Until this day, it still does that he wants to harass people who support me. And it's just mind blowing that I have nothing to do with him anymore except for these experiences. And it's still just not enough. We're going to split this up into two different episodes just because it was a lengthy episode. Yes. Um, so we have a part two. You can listen to it now, but that way. It's just easier to listen to. So absolutely. That's it. See you over there.